This is AstraZeneca's research facility in Sweden. Walls here are being torn down to promote conversation between scientists that could lead to medical breakthroughs. It's also a message at the heart of a stunning new headquarters taking shape in Cambridge. This is Bloomberg Turnaround. Join me to see how Pascal Sorio is building transparency and collaboration and putting the pep back into AstraZeneca. When AstraZeneca was searching for a new chief executive in 2011, it was poised to lose $17 billion in sales due to expiring patents. Pascal Sorio was appointed in 2012. His task? Replenish the drugs pipeline. Since his appointment, the share price has doubled. The problem was that uh, we had spent a lot of time doing rounds and rounds of cost cutting, reorganization and uh, doing share buybacks as opposed to doing what, what it was we should be doing as an industry, which was really focusing on science and developing medicines. On day one, Sorio suspended the buybacks. Sorio comes more from an operational and R&D background. And I think that the new people that were put in charge were also the types of people who were more focused on, on, on innovation than, than just um, sales and, and, and driving the top line. So more about the science. <clears throat> Absolutely, which is what pharmaceuticals is about. Sorio increased spending on research and development, focused on cancer, the fastest growing space in pharmaceuticals, and emboldened scientists to abandon unsuccessful research. You really have to make sure you choose projects that will succeed, but it's almost as important to choose the projects that you should not move into phase three, because if otherwise you spend a lot of money going nowhere. AstraZeneca uh, was in a situation where they had been losing uh, revenue for years and years and really through a focus back on science, uh, back on R&D, they were able to launch a number of products and the oncology business unit really started growing and for the first time in 2018 we saw AstraZeneca having the energy, uh, having the spirit and showing the growth numbers again and really delivering on the R&D pipeline. If there was a single thing Sorio did to demonstrate his tenure would be a new dawn, it was his championing of Limpaza, an ovarian cancer treatment the previous management had scrapped. It's now on its way to becoming a blockbuster, the moniker given to a billion dollar seller. Limpaza sparked Sorio's curiosity even before he joined the company. I talked to uh, key opinion leaders and I was really intrigued because I thought this drug looks interesting but they're not doing much with it and in fact they, have, they had announced uh, a write-off. They had decided to stop the program and they had written off the intangible, the goodwill that was associated with this product project. And I still remember I went to an, exp an opinion leader, an expert in the field, and uh, remember having this breakfast meeting with him in the US and he looked at me at some stage and he said, look, what you're doing is almost criminal because this drug should al already be treating patients. So I arrived with a clear view that it was one of the medicines I needed to look at. And in what, what I found is a research team that was really convinced this was a great drug and had been trying to convince the organization as a whole but had not been succeed, successful. In 2017, US drug maker Merck agreed to pay as much as $8.5 billion to share in the development of Limpaza, which can also be used for pancreatic and other cancers. The drug's expected to generate $2.5 billion in revenue this year and next, and along with other key treatments like Tegriso and Imfinzi, fuel the gains expected by analysts through 2020. He has a nose for a drug. When we showed him the data for Limpaza, when we showed him the data for Tegriso, he realized that these things could be medicines, and he helped us pull those things through the pipeline into late stage development and ultimately to launch into patients. That takes courage but it also helps us accelerate and push things faster. That was tremendous. You know, so things that were originally blocked were now unblocked and were moving really fast um, through the pipeline. AstraZeneca was formed in 1999 by the merger of Sweden's Astra and Zeneca of the UK. It's based in the British university town of Cambridge, 
where it's surrounded by some of the most renowned biopharmaceutical researchers in the world. In our industry, it's fundamental. There's nobody who wakes up one morning saying, OK, I've got the solution to uh, develop, de discovering a, a new products. The work we do requires people to work together. You need the scientists to understand what the future profile is going to look like, what the potential competitive angle is, and what the potential way of marketing it would be, and what the physicians would say. That's a very long list of things to have to deal with when you're dealing with a program that needs to take 10 years to come to market. Having everyone together and making sure that they're able to talk to each other is a key driver. Mene Pangalos showed me around the new campus and explained how the building is all about collaboration. We're really placing ourselves in the middle, in the heart of one of the best life sciences clusters in the UK and actually probably in the world. And the idea behind this building is that it's meant to be transparent, porous, collaborative, inviting to our partners, the people who are interested in the science that we're doing, so that we really make our science and our scientists accessible. And that's all part of our cultural transformation. Inside this construction, there are these huge laboratories embedded into the building. There's going to be 19,000 square meters of them. That's three football pitches. All the way along here, there's going to be the desks where the scientists will write up their experiments. And then, of course, all the support stuff. I'm told they can't wait to move in. <laughs> There's a lot more ahead on how AstraZeneca's new buildings are breaking down barriers. But first, fighting off Pfizer. At the end of the first day, the bankers must have felt a bit sorry for me. They came and they told me, you know, you, we have to tell you, you have less than 10% chance of remaining independent. <laughs> As the work on boosting AstraZeneca's drugs pipeline started to take off, a fresh threat appeared, Pfizer. It would be one of the biggest deals in all of pharma history. We know that Pfizer had made an approach in January. You've got a keen buyer, a very keen buyer, but perhaps not such a keen seller in this trade. In 2014, Astra's US rival made four attempts to buy it in less than six months. The final offer was for $117 billion. It would have been the biggest pharmaceuticals takeover ever. It was really an interesting day because I arrived in London and uh, opened my phone and my daughter had sent me a message telling me my, my wife was at the hospital with a pulmonary embolism. So I called her and she was fine. But it was a bit, of a, a bit of a stressful day. And then we arrived at the office and we started working the whole day with the lawyers, as you can imagine, bankers, lawyers, and our own people. And at the end of the first day, the bankers must have felt a bit sorry for me. They came and they told me, you know, you, we have to tell you, you have less than 10% chance of remaining independent. <laughs> so that was, uh, at the end of that day, I thought, wow, that was, that was an interesting thing. Well, day. you didn't believe them, clearly. <laughs> No, actually, sometimes, you know, when people tell me a project has a low probability of success and I believe in it, uh, I tell them, you know, 20% is not bad, actually, because I only had 10% of uh, chance of remaining independent. As Pfizer continued to chase to create the world's largest drug maker by sales, lawmakers in Britain, Sweden and the US grew increasingly critical. The most important intervention we can make is to back British jobs, British science, British R&D, British medicines and British technology. And that is why I asked the Cabinet Secretary and my ministers to engage with both companies right from the start of this process. AstraZeneca rejected the deal, disappointing many investors. This price doesn't reflect the new AstraZeneca. In the last 18 months we've made enormous progress We're building our pipeline. And we believe this pipeline is going to deliver value for patients, of course, but also for our shareholders. You had the board on the side, but you, you investors, many investors saying, no, it was the wrong thing to do. But I also understand that you managed to use this situation as a way of galvanizing the staff. What happened there? Yeah, I think it, uh, it was, of course, a stressful time for a stressful time, yes, for everybody in the company. But it was also a great time uh, in retrospect because it was a time when uh, we had this burning platform 
of showing that we could actually deliver value not only to patients but also to our shareholders we're just focusing on what we were doing and it really galvanized everybody to actually uh, you know do their best and that meant showcasing that AstraZeneca's future was bright Soria projected a 75 percent increase in annual revenue by 2023 and announced the company had 15 drugs nearly ready to go almost double from the year before. He promised investors their shares would rise beyond the £55 offer price. It took four years to get there. Our job is to turn science into medicine and ultimately get those medicines to patients. You looked at our success rates from 2005 to 2010. Our success rate from drugs entering clinical development, first in human experiments to launch, were around 4%. Today, in the most recent assessment we've done, which was looking at 2012 to 2016, our success rate has now gone up to 20%. We were very good at focusing on large numbers of projects, but that actually had a relatively low probability of being medicines. Today, we very much focus on the quality. We actually cut almost half of the projects in the pipeline. And even with that cut, we still improved our success rate significantly. So that was quality, not quantity, is hugely, hugely important. It's important to remain nimble and, and fast-paced, but in order to do that and make decisions, you yourself as a leader have to have a fair quantity of self-belief. Where does that come from? Well, it's actually uh, more than self-belief. It's about uh, belief in uh, the people you have around you, belief in uh, the advice you get, belief in, in the culture you've created. And it's really about uh, digging in the data, understanding what physicians think, experts think, and you know, aggregating all of this and analyzing it. And at the end of the day, it's about the belief of that you have to take risks. And then, and then at, at some point, you have to accept you may, be, you may fail. What is it that you bring to the organization to, that allows that, um, that, that communication to come out and, and, and for these drugs to be recognized when it wasn't before? One of the most important time points is when you, you are in the phase one, phase two, and you have to decide whether a drug should be developed in phase three. And here, you really have to look at it from all angles and really understand where it could help patients and what, how it could be used in clinical practice. And, and the way you do this is really by bringing people together and, uh, and, and really you know, brainstorming and debating and discussing the data and the various opinions. But also beyond that, I think you need to create the right kind of culture. One of the issues we had was, you know, we had exp experienced a few setbacks in development. We had three products that failed in late stage development in 2007, eight or something like that. And that happens, all the companies have experienced that. But at the time, the management, the company decided, okay, well, we're not gonna fail again. And so, you know, when you tell people we're not going to fail, uh, you never fail in phase three because you never move anything in phase three. You've got to really create an, uh, an environment where people feel comfortable taking some educated risks. So it really is about sharing knowledge, sharing data, debating, and being willing to take educated risks. We have entered into an agreement of global joint development and commercialization with AstraZeneca. Sorio's most significant educated risk so far was a $6.9 billion deal in March with Japan's Daiichi Sankyo to develop a breast cancer treatment that could even replace chemotherapy, potentially reshaping the future of cancer care. The potential is very large uh, and we see it as a mega blockbuster. AstraZeneca was obliged to partly fund it with a $3.5 billion share sale highlighting the company's scarce cash resources. They needed to raise money from the market, and they raised a little bit more because they have some debt repayments coming up. That, I think, highlighted the cash flow needs. Of course, they could have gone and probably given up some of their rating and raised debt again, but that would have been expensive. People would say equity is expensive, but at the end of the day, this was a much faster way of getting what they needed, and they did it. But that's a, there's a focus on cash flow. The Daiichi deal. Why is that a, a, key, a key deal for AstraZeneca? I, I think people today don't really understand fully the potential of this uh, medicine. It can transform uh, breast cancer treatment. And I personally believe it can be a very big product. And I don't think people have totally realized how big it can be. <laughs>
Coming up, we go to Sweden, where AstraZeneca has thrown away the keys and invited outside businesses to install themselves right next to its scientists. The emphasis on bringing people together is a key plank of Sorio's turnaround. The investment into buildings like this in Cambridge and these in Sweden is all about getting people to come together and share ideas. The company was operating in silos and, uh, and actually not necessarily believing in each other. So you had a commercial function and then you had an R&D function and, and, and there was not a lot of belief, uh, say in commercial, that R&D was delivering and in R&D we had also fragmented teams. We had the Medimmune team, we had you know, very diff many different teams not working really together. At the Gothenburg site, there is a huge model that shows how existing and new buildings are going to work together. Most of the world's brilliant minds do not work for AstraZeneca. We have 64,000 fantastic employees, but most great ideas are conceived somewhere else. And if we are going to take part of that, we are going to have to work completely different with the external world. Joachim Reichel yeah. is one of those charged with making the changes. All right, this is clearly one of the modern, new facilities for research and development. Why does this work more productively for AstraZeneca? As you can see, it's a much more open environment. We have torn down the walls, and we have scientists from different disciplines working in this environment, which makes it easier for collaboration. Why does it make it easier? Are they working on the same disciplines? Or are they wor They're working on different diseases. We have scientists that are researching heart disease, kidney disease, and respiratory disease. And the interesting thing is that those diseases have some commonalities, which now we can actually understand better by having those scientists working together in the same space. And so before, all of these people would have been working separately on they their would, own disciplines. They would have been working in separate labs, absolutely. Another innovation is the BioVenture Hub, where companies are invited to establish themselves inside the campus and given the same access as the rest of the staff. What it means in practice, as I see it, is that talented people with new technologies and new ideas will get inside AstraZeneca, build their companies, build their, develop their science, and they will do that together with AstraZeneca, formally and informally. This is a completely different company. So as an example, we today have our BioVenture hub here at the company. It's 34 external companies, same pass card as I have, access to our full site. We share knowledge. About 18 years ago, when I joined AstraZeneca, we almost pulled down the curtains before open a drawer. That, that's a major, major change that we've angered. Katarina Algerborg, the chief executive of AstraZeneca Sweden, says the coffee lab at the Gothenburg campus is but one example of how the dynamic is changing inside the company. I think the biggest thing is the cultural change uh, in how we operate in terms of opening up, working a lot more with uh, smaller companies, academia and you know just around the world, collaborating more externally not assuming we have the best people every day inside, but rather opening up is one big thing. I also think actually the cultural thing, uh, sometimes we forget that it's, he has been driving a very, very values driven way of working. I think if you walk around here or anywhere in AstraZeneca, everyone would know our five values. And it, it actually it really means something to people. So, you know, we put patients first, we follow the science, we're entrepreneurial, we play to win and we do the right thing. Sorio continues to make changes to gain an edge. In January, he reorganized R&D into two divisions, one to focus on cancer, the fastest growing and most lucrative part of the industry, and the other to oversee the rest. It was necessary because the structure we had in place served us very well for about five years or so. Uh, five years ago, we didn't have much in our pipeline. We had to create these uh, early units that were kind of a biotech units, 
coming up with new products. But as we were uh, becoming more successful with a full pipeline, the structure was playing against us a little bit. We were becoming a bit too bureaucratic and too focused on governance. And our oncology pipeline in particular has grown tremendously. And oncology is a little bit different from uh, the rest of pharmaceuticals. So I decided that uh, the uh, reorganization was necessary so we could move very quickly from research to early development to late development in oncology, bring people together from research to development to commercial, in oncology, but also in biopharmaceuticals. And when it comes to building new markets, AstraZeneca, like many, is looking to China and its increasingly affluent patients. When did you first begin to see China as a key market? Uh, almost immediately because, you know, the, as I started, I really had to look for areas where we could grow. You know, I had to look for the strengths of the company and, and Number one, where we could rebuild the pipeline, how we could rebuild the pipeline, but also looking at this massive patent expiry uh, that we were facing, where could I find growth? And China was one of those. And in fact, the pipeline of uh, the portfolio of products we had and still have really addresses the needs of p uh, patients in China. So immediately I thought, you know, we have to invest in China and keep going. Since becoming AstraZeneca's CEO, Sorio has refocused the company on science. He's reconfigured buildings to open them to outside minds and ideas, and he's replenished the company's pipeline. 2012, AstraZeneca was a completely different company. We had great sales, great profit, and virtually no pipeline whatsoever. This is the time that Pascal Sorio came into the company and that the company changed uh, leadership. So if we fast forward from that time, about five or six years, from almost no pipeline whatsoever, some analysts claimed that, that we had the best pipeline in the industry. But questions remain about the dearth of cash flow, highlighted by the Daiichi deal. The issue for Astra is that there's, there's only so much cash, and as we know that is one of the key questions around the company. Let's go more into that though, so why is that a question? Well, pharmaceutical companies are um, historically great cash generators. There's two reasons people have historically invested in pharmaceutical companies. One is the, the fact that they're driven by demographics and they are a defensive sector, normally. And the other one is that they throw off tons of cash. So where the cash flow becomes a bit thinner, that becomes a question. And of course, there's not much you can do when three, say roughly $5 billion products at the same time are going off patent. And products at the end of their lives are very profitable because they don't need much detailing. How do you, you, know, how do you replace that? That's a, that's a pretty difficult thing to do. That said, Fazeli says AstraZeneca's latest results did indicate that cash flow is going to improve on the back of growth and high margin products. As far as Sorio is concerned, it's not his biggest worry. Witness a decision announced in June to invest $630 million over the next five years in the South Korean healthcare sector, or a $220 million commitment to Vietnam's health sector, unveiled in May. The bigger risk for us is to become complacent. Actually, you know, it's interesting. We didn't have anything. We then were uh, potentially uh, acquired, and there was an enormous burning platform for all of us to do our best and uh, work hard and move fast. And as you become successful, you can become slower and more complacent. So that's the one thing, really, we, I don't want to see happen.